Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, today is our pleasure to have Ricardo here to uh, share about his recent work on exponential quantum advantage in learning quantum observable from classical data. I think this work is pretty cool with me just outlining some kind of situations where we can uh, attend quantum advantage. And Ricardo will be able to tell us more about it. Ricardo, the floor is here. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the nice invitation. Hi, everyone. I am uh, Ricardo Molteni. I'm a PhD student at uh, Leiden University. And uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about my latest paper that I did with uh, Kasper Gurik and Vedran Dunico, always from the uh, University of Leiden. So first of all, again, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and be able to talk about my latest work. And uh, so let's get started. So the title of our paper is Exponential Quantum Advantages in Learning Quantum Observable from Classical Data. So uh, first of all, let me just uh, tell you what we were trying to do in this work. So the question that we were trying to address is uh, one of the most interesting questions, I would say, in quantum machine learning. And it is, uh, when are quantum computers better at a learning task? I will add to this uh, that we were looking at, at uh, physical motivated learning tasks. But for now, let's just uh, keep this question. And uh, in order also to better motivate our work, let's just see what was previously known before our work about advantages in learning. And uh, yes, what uh, like the, in the literature that, uh, that was already present. So when we think about quantum computing, we know that uh, quantum computers uh, offer advantage when computing function, which come basically from two big field. So we know that, uh, what I mean, I mean that a quantum computer can compute uh, a function exponentially faster with respect to a classical computer. And uh, we from a function which basically comes from a cryptographic problem based on factoring. For example, we know discrete logarithm, discrete queue root can be computed efficiently faster on a quantum device, but also quantum simulation, right? We know that uh, time evolution is BQP complete. We know that guided local Hamiltonian is uh, BQP complete as well. So we know that from these two big fields, quantum computer offer advantage when we want to compute a function. However, if we look uh, at the literature, and we were discussing before, uh, before that uh, if you look at the literature, the mainly uh, the majority of provable advantage are related to function which come from the first big field, from cryptographic problem. And to, to understand why this happened and also to uh, better motivate our work, I, I need you to introduce to introduce you to the what we mean by learning task in our work. And I will do that using Pack Pac framework. So in PAC framework, you can model a supervised learning problem uh, such that it consists to learn a, a concept from a known concept class given training sample. So let me just explain what I mean. So in, in PAC framework, we are given a concept class, which is just a set of function labeled say by an alpha, and each concept goes from B string to zero one. So uh, we have to learn a concept from training data. What does it mean? It means that uh, we have a train data, which are just a sample of X and F alpha of X, so evaluation of the of the concept on that X, where X comes from an, an, a, a fixed distribution, let's say. So we, we give this training data to our learning algorithm A, and we ask for the learning algorithm to output a function H that behaves uh, as well as our uh, unknown concept. So what I mean, just to give you an ex a simple example, suppose that uh, the concept that we, we are trying to learn is a function which uh, label cats and dogs, right? So in this case, training data will be sample images of cat with the corresponding uh, label cat and images of dog with the corresponding label dog. We give this training data to the, our learning algorithm and we ask from the learning algorithm to output a function H such that on new images on uh, cat and dog, we label uh, them correctly, basically. So in, in our work, uh, I will tell you later, but uh, we are uh, looking in uh, uh, learning uh, observable. What do we mean? I mean that uh, in our work, uh, the axis will uh, label uh, quantum state, and I will tell you how, is, uh, how they label quantum states. But basically, the idea is that the axis label quantum state, and the concepts are expectation value of an observable labeled by alpha on that quantum state labeled by x. 
So we have different axes, different quantum state, and the training data are just expectation value of the observable that we are trying to learn on that quantum state labeled by X. So we give this training data to our learning algorithm, and we ask that the learning algorithm outputs a function H, and we say that the learning algorithm efficiently learns the concept class F, so the set of functions that we said before, if for every concept in this class, for every function in the, in the set F, given training sample from that function, the learning algorithm outputs with high probability a, mo a function H such that agrees with the unknown concept uh, with low error on average with respect to the input distribution, right? So this uh, means uh, on average with respect to the input distribution, it agrees with the unknown concept with a low error. And of course, we want the whole thing to be efficient. So we want uh, that uh, the whole process is, uh, is in polynomial time with respect to n and the error that uh, it produces. So uh, given that, uh, I told you before that uh, we believe that uh, quantum computers are exponentially faster in computing determined function. And uh, so uh, we believe uh, that uh, BQP is, uh, contains uh, uh, BPP, strictly contains BPP. So one question could be, OK, I just take one concept from uh, outside BPP, but inside BQP, so that we know that quantum computer give an advantage in computing that uh, function. And I put that concept in my concept class. Then now, why this is not sufficient to have a learning advantage? Why this doesn't give us a learning advantage? Well, the answer is that uh, learning a function and computing a function are two different things. The reason there are three main differences between computing and learning a function. The first difference, which is the most uh, uh, strong difference, let, I would say, is data gap. In machine learning, when we want to learn a function, we are provided with data. And data can give us uh, uh, stronger uh, information, stronger information about the function that we want to compute. And I will give an example of that in uh, the next slide. The second thing is uh, quantum learnability. OK, we know that uh, this function could be hard to compute classically, but we also have to prove that a quantum learner can, can uh, select from the training data the right concept. Uh, the right concept. And we know, for example, just to give you an example, that shallow quantum circuit, uh, uh, they, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they can be evaluated on a quantum computer, but they cannot be learned from uh, this paper. And also, the last thing is that uh, when we talk about complexity theory, we, also, we usually are interested in uh, worst case scenario. So the algorithm has to work for all the axes. Whereas in machine learning, we are uh, typically only required correctness on average, right? In the formula that I gave you before, it's just uh, on average, it has to output a, a function which agrees with the unknown concept. So let me just uh, give you an example on uh, why data can change the hardness of a problem. Consider a quantum circuit. Consider, uh, and uh, in the middle of this quantum circuit, there is a parameterized gate, parameterized by theta, like a rotation gate, for example. So consider I take the I take the function, I define the function, the expectation value on an observable on that circuit with respect to theta, to the parameterized uh, gate. So if the circuit around theta is uh, general enough, it is, if it is hard enough, we do not have a classical algorithm which is able to compute f of theta for different theta. However, from uh, the GTP formalism, I don't know if you're familiar with, but basically. Uh, we know that the output of this uh, expectation value with respect to theta is a trigonometric function. Moreover, it's a trigonometric function where the only three unknown parameters are these alpha, beta, and gamma. But then what happens? If I give you training sample, so if I give you sample of this f of theta for different uh, theta, let's say just for three different theta, and again, training data are just theta and the evaluation of f of theta, then I can fit this function, right? I, I can fit it for the unknown parameter and I can learn the function. So this is an example why, when uh, data can actually really change the hardness of a computational problem. But uh, uh, I told you before that uh, in the literature there are uh, results from, uh, for uh, uh, provable advantages in learning uh, uh, cryptographic function. And I will tell you now why why, how they prove that uh, data cannot uh, change the hardness. And basically, it's simply because you can classically generate data. So they cannot help. So let me just uh, 
give you an example. Consider the discrete logarithm. The discrete logarithm. We know that uh, computing the discrete logarithm is hard, right? Because it involves to factorize basically this p, which if it is a, a large prime, it is hard. However, the inverse is easy. So the modular exponentiation, it's easy. You can do it uh, uh, classically. But then what can I do? I can sample uniformly y, right? B string y, and I can compute the modular exponentiation. In this case, I can generate data x and discrete logarithm of x with a classical device. So the conclusion here is that uh, data cannot give me more information, cannot uh, change the hardness of a problem of compute uh, discrete logarithm. Why? Because I can generate data. I, I have a classical algorithm which can generate data. So this is a one way to prove uh, uh, learning separation is basically taking hardness, like uh, one function which is hard to compute, and plus I can generate data for that function. So we started with the initial question, when do we have learning advantages? And one possible answer uh, that we look in the, we have seen in the literature is uh, when concepts are hard, but data are easy generatable, right? In this case, we have a learning advantage. But uh, what about quantum simulation? What about, uh, I told you that I wanted a physical motivated learning uh, scenario. So for quantum simulation, we do not really expect that classical algorithms can generate data, right? We do not expect that uh, you can generate measurement on ground states, on time evolved states. So in order to prove a separation for this kind of task, we need a slightly stronger assumption from complexity theory. And I will uh, introduce them to you now. So what we need, uh, first of all, I need to introduce advice classes. So how do you think about advice classes is basically you have to think that the algorithm which has to decide input, so if X belongs to a language or not, is provided with an advice. So what is an advice? It's just a B string of polynomial size, uh, which is passed to the algorithm which has to decide if X belongs to the, that language or not. So importantly, the advice depends on the size of the input, so on the number of bits of the input, it has to be polynomial in the size of the input, but it is otherwise input independent. So I mean that for every X, I receive one advice and the algorithm can use this advice to decide all the X's, but I have only one advice for all the X's. Why I needed to introduce you advice classes? Well, because if you think about it, training data is a form of, of an advice, right? Training data is just a, a polynomial number of a sample, we usually require that sample are polynomial, which are passed to the learner that aid the, lear the learner to classify all the new axes. So in particular, you can think a machine learning problem, and this is done by Robert Wang in Power of Data, as a, a algorithm which works in BPP slash SAMP, where SAMP are exactly this uh, SAMP with the sample from X and F of X, right? Of course, uh, he proved that uh, BVP slash SAMP is contained in P slash poly. So, and I will, def I will later define what is P slash poly, but uh, now the idea is uh, we, we believe that P we have a reason for believing that P slash poly is not contained in uh, that uh, BQP, that, uh, BQ B that there are functions in BQP which are outside P slash poly. So these functions are not uh, evaluatable, even if I give you an advice, even if I give you training data. So to finally, to uh, capture all the uh, machine learning problem, we can define the heuristic version of P slash poly. Heuristic, why? Because I told you before that uh, we are not interested in the worst case scenario, but uh, we are interested in average case. And these her heuristic things ca precisely capture this condition of average. So let me just define what uh, a problem in P slash poly is, and then we can move on. Move on. So a language and the distribution is said to be in herpes slash poly if there is a classical algorithm such that for every input size, I get, there is one advice string, one string of polynomial size, such that if I pass this advice string to that uh, classical algorithm, can uh, correctly decide input X uh, with respect to, with a low error on average, with respect to a distribution D. And this, so this precisely capture what machine learning is. You have a classical algorithm, which is passed as an advice 
uh, training data and has to decide the new axis on average. So uh, we can use this separation from BQP and P slash poly to uh, say something about uh, learning separation for a BQP complete function. What uh, precisely we mean in the previous work from uh, Casper was uh, shown that if for every BQP complete problem, so for every BQP complete function, there exists one distribution such that learning the function on that distribution is R. Precisely what uh, he proved was that uh, if uh, we believe that there is one language and one distribution that is that it is outside p slash uh, her p slash poly, but inside BQP, then for every BQP complete function, so for every BQP complete problem, there exists one associated distribution such that the learning problem is outside her p, p slash poly. And again, outside her p slash poly means that non-classical algorithm can learn the function on average with using a training data, using an advice, which is a, a training data. So, so let's just uh, summarize what uh, was uh, known about uh, learning advantages. So we have uh, two cases where we can prove uh, advantage in learning a function. One case is uh, I take one uh, uh, hard concept, cryptographic concept, for example, and I prove that I can generate data easily for that concept. So data cannot uh, provide me more information. And so the problem of learning that function is still hard. The other way to prove uh, hardness is uh, I take one BQP complete function, which I, I show that uh, BQP, I believe that BQP is outside her p slash poly. So I cannot compute that function even with the aid of, of data. And so I'm sure that uh, for every BQP complete function, there exists one distribution such that learning that function on that distribution is classically hard. So these are the two ways to prove uh, classical hardness of uh, learning a function even in presence of data. And uh, however, we still need uh, to show that you can quantumly learn the function. It, so for, for example, if I take a, a, if I take a, a BQP complete function, I know that it is classically hard to, to learn it. However, remember that in pack learning, we are given a set of this function, right? A set which we call concept class. And this function are labeled by say alpha. So the question is, okay, this, this function, if I take BQP complete function, this function are harder to learn classically. We have uh, proven this, but how can a quantum algorithm learn it? How can, uh, given training sample, a quantum algorithm, how can uh, see say, okay, this is the alpha that uh, gives me this training sample? Well, one way to do it, and it was uh, uh, shown in a Casper paper before, is that uh, if I take my concept class uh, to be polynomial of size, so I only have a polynomial function in my set F, well, then the quantum algorithm can do perform brute search and see which of the, of the function fits the training data. However, we are not really happy on this because this doesn't model what, uh, in a, what is in a physical relevant task. This doesn't happen. You, don't, you usually do not have a polynomial size uh, uh, concept class. So uh, here we come in the contribution that uh, we did in, our, in this work. And basically what we did is study a physical relevant, relevant instantiation of a BQP complete function. What we mean is uh, we take one physically motivated problem for which uh, the, the learning fun the function that we have to learn is BQP complete. So the main feature of this work with respect to previous work is that it is a physically motivated task. So we are actually learning observable, something that uh, it's, it is interesting for uh, experiment for, uh, for physics. The second thing is that uh, the quantum learning algorithm is not trivial. So it's not a brute search. It utilizes quantum cap capabilities to extract relevant inf information from data. So I really need a quantum algorithm to extract information from uh, data, and then I can learn that function using a non-trivial uh, machine learning algorithm. And uh, as a consequence, uh, the concept class is not polynomial size. So uh, we, uh, we, we, will, uh, we will work with uh, actually continuous concept class, but uh, you can think of, uh, of it as an exponential size concept class. And for this class, brute search does not work. So uh, we are finally able to talk about our uh, first results in uh, this paper. And this is uh, advantages 
in learning linear combination of Pauli observable. So I will introduce to you the task. So the task is learning in a non-linear combination of Pauli string observable from measurement on time evolved input state. So let me just uh, uh, define you the task is we have input X, which are B string, which come from a, a fixed distribution D. And uh, suppose that you have a circuit that for each axis, it prepares this uh, uh, time evolved state. So basically X will define the starting state, the initial state, which is a, a, basically a computational basis state. And then you apply a evolution U, which uh, is a, which depends on a local Hamiltonian H for a given time tau. So imagine that you have this circuit, which implement for every X, this time evolve uh, states, and then you measure an observable. The observable will depend on alpha, and this is just a linear combination of Pauli string where a coefficient depends on alpha, right? Alpha will be a vector, and uh, for every uh, M, for, for every Pauli string, there is a vector, there is a coefficient, alpha i. And of course, uh, we are talking about local Pauli. So these uh, sums will contain polynomial many terms. It's not an exponential uh, many term sum. So in our case, these concepts are uh, labeled by alpha and, are, uh, and takes B string and output a real number, which is the expectation value again of this uh, time evolved state uh, for uh, this unknown observable. We do not know alpha. And the concept class is again, all this uh, function, which uh, will depend on alpha. And as training data, we are given X and expectation value on, of the unknown observable on the, the state uh, psi, of, psi u of x. And uh, to make this uh, uh, task close to what happens in real uh, world, we allow that uh, the sample y, the expectation y value, are not uh, perfect, but we allow some sampling error. So training data are given x and uh, expectation value with sampling error of the unknown observable. So we say that uh, the algorithm A efficiently learn the concept class with respect to the distribution D if for every function in the concept class, given training sample that I defined you before, output a function H such that on average, output a value which is close to the unknown concept, to the target concept uh, for a, a low error, basically. And again, we want uh, this to be efficient. So we want this to be done in a polynomial time and uh, we respect to n, the input dimension, and the errors. So the results, the first our results of our paper, I will uh, tell you the old theorem, then we will divide it. So the old theorem is, says that uh, assuming that BQP is outside the uh, RP slash poly, and uh, by the way, we have, uh, uh, we have a reasoning to believe that this is true. For example, we know that DLP is not uh, uh, inside P slash poly, for example. So assuming that BQP is outside her piece poly, then for every BQP complete language, there is a, a distribution D over the input value, or value X, an Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian, and a set of, of observable such that no classical algorithm can solve the time evolution learning problem that we defined in the slide before. So we say, what we say, say is that assuming that BQP is outside her piece poly, then I take one whatever uh, BQP complete language, then there exists one distribution D and a local Hamiltonian and a set of observable such that no classical algorithm can solve the, as, uh, the related time evolution learning problem. However, there exists a quantum algorithm which learn exactly that concept class, which is hard for a classical uh, uh, learner under any distribution D. And uh, I will show now uh, the proof. I will just uh, show the basic idea of the proof. So the proof actually consists of two parts, right? For uh, the first part, we have to show classical hardness of the learning task. So we have to show that uh, no classical learning algorithm can uh, learn the thing. And then we have to show uh, quantum learnability. So we have to show that there exists a quantum algorithm which is uh, instead able to learn uh, the concept for every concept in the concept class. So, so classical. let's start with classical hardness. Goal, what, what we want to prove? We want to prove that uh, there exists an Hamiltonian, a local Hamiltonian, and a class of, of observable such that the time evolution problem is not classically learnable, so that we cannot learn this observable uh, on, on average on, uh, in, uh, with respect to the input uh, distribution over x. 
The idea, what is the idea of the probe, is uh, to consider an Hamiltonian H such that one of the concept is BQPR function. Why? Because I told you again that uh, we believe that the BQP is uh, outside uh, her p slash poly. So if one of the concept is a BQP hard, then it must be means that uh, uh, there is a one distribution such that that concept cannot be learned by a classical algorithm, even in the presence of data. And uh, how can we do that? Well, we know that uh, time evolution is a BQP complete. We know that uh, we can encode a quant whatever quantum computation in a time evolution uh, uh, as a time evolution. So there exists a local Hamiltonian such that uh, the computing the Z uh, observable on the fourth qubit gives a BQP complete uh, uh, function, basically. In particular, uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, exactly. We will consider al the alpha for which uh, the observable means uh, to just measure the Z observable on the fourth qubit. So in particular, you can think alpha as a alpha alpha related to this Pauli string to be one and all the other to be zero. So, but then this trivially, if uh, uh, suppose if there was a, a classical algorithm which given training set related to this concept will uh, uh, achieve this uh, error on average with respect to the distribution, to the input distribution, then uh, this classical algorithm will be able to decide BQP uh, languages on average with respect to the distribution D. However, I just told you that we do not believe that this is the case. We believe that for BQP complete things, you cannot uh, learn, you cannot compute, you cannot uh, uh, decide BQP complete uh, languages in her p slash poly. So this is uh, the basic idea of how you prove classical hardness. And now let's move to quantum learnability that I told you that uh, we do not have uh, here, like the novel thing is that uh, we do not have a trivial quantum algorithm. We have a, a quantum algorithm which actually uh, like learned the concept. It's not just research. And uh, I'll give you the whole statement here, and then I will go through details. So the basically is that uh, we prove that there is a quantum algorithm such that for every concept in the concept class, which is uh, which we know that is hard for classical algorithms, uh, there is a quantum algorithm such that given training data, of size uh, polynomial in n, log n times n, with, with high probability outputs a model H which correctly classify uh, the un every, every unknown concept. How is it possible? Uh, well, the basic idea is that the quantum algorithm can prepare time evolved state, like for a Hamiltonian, for the Hamiltonian, for a local Hamiltonian with not uh, exponential norm, you can prepare time evolved state of uh, psi u of x. And moreover, the quantum algorithm can compute uh, expectation value of this Pauli string on this time evolved state. And remember, we know this Pauli string. We know that the observable is four by this Pauli string. We just don't know the coefficient. So once uh, he, lo he computed this Pauli string, then he can find uh, uh, the right alpha using a regression uh, algorithm. In particular, we will use the lasso algorithm, which is a linear regression algorithm where uh, we constrain the L1 norm of the solution given by this algorithm. So uh, to give you more, uh, more detail about this algorithm, basically it's very simple. You are given training data, which are X and expectation value of uh, the unknown concept. And for each training data, the quantum algorithm compute the evo time evolved state, which you can do it as is in, B is in BQP and take expectation value of each Pauli string of the unknown observable. So basically what it define is a kind of a feature map where you associate each X to this vector phi of X of expectation value on time evolved state with uh, for every Pauli string. And then he define this linear model W times uh, phi of X. And what we ask now is that uh, with a classical algorithm, with a lasso algorithm to find the optimal W. So the lasso algorithm, uh, uh, promise us to, to find this optimal uh, W star that minimizes this sum uh, where uh, while maintaining the L1 norm of the output uh, of the optimal W star to be lower than B. And we have, uh, we know that uh, the lasso algorithm is a, the training sample required to achieve uh, this uh, minimization is given by its polynomial in B. In, B is a hyperparameter. And we know that the optimal B is, a, is a related to the alpha. 
to the alpha, and uh, we know that this is polynomial in n. So the whole thing works in polynomial with polynomial sample and with polynomial time. So from this, so this is uh, one example where we can show uh, learning separation, but uh, there is also, then we can use the same strategies basically to define uh, learning separation, even for a uh, ground state problem. What I mean here, the task is uh, to learn again in a non-linear combination of Pauli string observable from measurement on ground state. So in this case, psi u of x will be the ground state of a Hamil local Hamiltonian h of x, which come from a family of Hamiltonian. So in this now h x will uh, define the Hamiltonian for which psi u of x will uh, be the ground state. So again, we are given x which come from a distribution, and then we have we are given expectation value of an unknown assortable on this uh, uh, quantum state, right? And here, so the concept, the concept are again, expectation value of O alpha on psi of x, where psi of x is a ground state now. Concept class is again, a set of function as, a, as training data, the same thing as before. And uh, now how can we show separation? Well, we, did, we do the same thing as before, but just, uh, consider the set of Hamiltonian, the Kitaiva Hamiltonian, and don't know if you're familiar with, but basically with the Kitaiva Hamiltonian, we can encode any uh, BQP uh, computation on its ground state. So we, we are guaranteed that uh, a quantum computer can evaluate uh, those uh, ground state, while a classical algorithm cannot. And so this, the whole strategy of classical hardness and the quantum learnability follow exactly the same thing as for the time evolution uh, problem. So this, uh, was uh, uh, our first main result in the paper. The second main result is about advantages in learning unitarily parameterized observable. What, uh, what me we mean is now we take in consideration observable where th they are not simply a linear uh, combination of Pauli string, but, I are, but they are parameterized by a unitary W alpha, which will depend on alpha. So why we do this? Well, as the first question is uh, we wanted to, to know what happens when the observable is not uh, just a linear parameterization, that, uh, a, a, sorry, a, a linear combinization where uh, you can learn the thing using a, a linear regression like Lasso. And the second motivation is that uh, there are a lot of recent results for learning a unitary, like recently in, uh, in the literature. And uh, we ask, can we connect to them? Can we use those results to uh, construct a, a quantum learning algorithm for learning even this kind of observable? So here now, uh, see, we are still given x, which are b-string from uh, zero, zero 0,1, are n b-string bit zero 0,1. And uh, here the unitary u of x will prepare a state psi u of x that I will define before. And uh, we take a, a expectation value of an observable, which is uh, parameterized by this unitary w, which will depend on alpha. And the uh, same as before, concept are expectation value of this observable, we have a concept class. And that training data we gave uh, evaluation of this uh, expectation value, <clears throat> same thing as before. So uh, the first result, the general results, uh, says that for every learning algorithm, AW, which learns a unitary, uh, given evaluation of that unitary on prob states, which come from S and then measure on, uh, with, me with observable, which come from Q. Uh, so every uh, learning algorithm of this time of this kind induces a classical input, classical output learning problem with a quantum learning advantage. So what do we mean by this phrase is basically, if there exists a learning algorithm such that learns a unitary W, given evaluation of that unitary, uh, uh, given evaluation of that unitary on prob, on prob state psi, which come from a set S and then measure from uh, observable, which come from a set Q. So for every of this kind of algorithm, we can construct a learning problem such that uh, the a learning problem about learning unitary parameterized observable such that show classical and quantum uh, separation. How can we do that? I give you the just the proof sketch. So now uh, let's forget. Let's look at this picture. Let's forget about uh, the register x q and uh, b a for the moment. And, uh, and now we are given x right. We are given x uh, which are just b string. And now u of x. Uh, will act on the, we create this state psi, psi u of x, depending on the value of the first b string. So if the, of, of the first bit, sorry. If the first bit is zero, then this psi u and s of x will be 
one of the probe state that is needed for the learning algorithm to learn the unitary W alpha. Whereas if the first bit is one, then this U of X will perform a BQP complete computation, which can be time evolution, for example, but any BQP computation on the remaining bits of input bits uh, excess, right? So again, I, I, I have a B string which come from a distribution over uh, uh, I, over B string from zero one N. And then uh, for if the first bit is zero, this U of X will prepare this exactly the states that are needed for the learning algorithm to learn this uh, W alpha. Whereas if uh, X is one, it will perform a BQP complete computation. But then if I met, if the, now I measure these things with an observable, which is just the Z observable on the first qubit, then I for I, I know that I uh, for for alpha of the B string, namely all the B string for which the first bit is one, no classical algorithm can learn uh, this function, right? For the same reason as before, it's a BQP complete function, is outside herpes slash poly. So on alpha of the input B string, you cannot a classical algorithm cannot perform well. So we are guaranteed that. Uh, a classical algorithm can not learn the function for uh, uh, at least half of the B string. However, how can, uh, uh, so again, classical algorithm RNS is uh, achieved using uh, choosing W alpha to be uh, the identity, W zero, sorry, to be the identity. So remember, it alpha uh, labels the concept and the classical algorithm has to learn for every concept in the concept class. So if I take W alpha to be the identity, for uh, alpha equals zero, and they measure with uh, just the Z observable in the first qubit, I know that uh, it's an, uh, you cannot learn this function on more than uh, alpha of the B string, for which the bit is uh, one, basically you cannot learn. However, quantum learnability is guaranteed by considering this uh, V alpha, uh, basically rotates the state, the, this observable in, the, in exactly the observable that is needed to learn this uh, W alpha. So what we say is that if there is a, a, an algorithm which learn this W alpha for every alpha, given evaluation of this W alpha on probe state and measure with some observable which come from a certain set, well, then for alpha of the B string in the training data, namely for the B string for X, where X is zero, this, we will have exactly these uh, probe states that are needed to learn this W alpha. And uh, this V alpha will uh, rotate this observable to have uh, the observable needed to have the observable needed to learn this W alpha. So we can use this alpha of uh, training, training state to exactly learn uh, this uh, W alpha. And let me just give you a concrete example to clear uh, the thing based on uh, recent results from Robert Wang. So in this paper, he showed that uh, you can learn uh, basically shallow quantum observable. What we mean by shallow quantum observable, we mean observable of this type where O is a local observable and the W alpha is a shallow unitary for every alpha. And uh, basically what happens? He showed that you can learn uh, this observable given evaluation, given training sample of this observable on uh, states which are uh, single qubit stabilizer state. So if, if, if I give you evaluation of this observable for every alpha on uh, uh, single qubit uh, stabilizer states, then I, uh, he showed that you can uh, recover uh, this observable. So then I make this U of X, I make it the same as before. If X1 is zero, this, uh, this U of X will prepare here on the, on the NS register, a single qubit stabilizer state. And then I have a training sample for uh, this unknown W alpha uh, on this state. Whereas if X1 is uh, one, this will perform a BQP complete computation on this NS uh, bis bit qubit, sorry. So again, on this, uh, on I cannot, a classical algorithm, if I sample random X, a classical algorithm cannot be correct for the X for which X1 is equal one, whereas a quantum algorithm can use the training sample where X1 is zero to learn this W alpha, and then is able to compute this observable on every input state, basically. So for, with this, I come to the conclusion of our results. So this is uh, the big table which uh, summarizes what we did. So we looked at uh, learning problem uh, of learning observable with uh, 
of several of two types. First one is a linear combination of Pauli string, and we show that uh, we have a separation for the time evolution problem where the quantum states are a time evolved quantum state, and we have a separation for a ground state problem. We also look at flipped concept. So let me just briefly uh, define what I mean by flipped concept. Well, we showed that before that uh, we have a concept class and the, each concept is labeled by alpha where alpha defines the observable, right? So each concept is uh, given a, as input X, which will define quantum state. I have a expectation value related to one observable or alpha. So we ask what happens when we flip the role of X and alpha? It's still hard, easy, is it classically easy? Well, it turns out to be classically easy. And this is simply because if you flip the role of X on alpha, now each concept is basically expectation value of different observable labeled by alpha, which will be the input on the same quantum state. So now I do not care how hard is to uh, compute this quantum state because it's only one for each concept, for each function that I have to learn, there is only one quantum state and I have expectation value of different observable re related to the input. But then I can uh, basically perform a, a linear regression and I can uh, uh, compute this fx of alpha for, the, for all the alpha given uh, enough training data. So this uh, uh, turned out to be classically easy. Then we move to unitarily parameterized observable and uh, we show that uh, learning the concept is uh, uh, present a learning separation and using the construction, the construction that I showed you before well, then we look at Hamiltonian learning that if you think about it, it's a kind of, uh, uh, we are given expectation value of uh, on time evolved states of, of some Pauli string, but there the objective is not to uh, evaluate the function, is to tell me which uh, Hamiltonian performed the evolution. And uh, for this, we do not have a learning advantage, of course, because there are a lot of results where uh, Hamiltonian learning is doable in uh, using classical algorithms. And then we uh, pose the question about identifying the concept. So what I mean by identifying the concept, again, we have a, in pack learning, we have a concept class, which is just a set of function. And uh, we have a target concept, uh, which, is, uh, which is the one which labeled the data, which is basically a, a evaluation, a expectation value of an absorbable on, uh, on state, right? And before, like we, the thing that I showed you before, we require to the, to the classical algorithms to learn the function, me, meaning that for new axes, it has to be able to evaluate uh, uh, to, uh, to output a function, which uh, the evaluation on this axis is close to f, f of alpha. However, in the, in the identification problem, we require to the classical algorithm to output a label alpha prime such that is close to the alpha which label the train data. So we have a train data, which are again, evaluation of for one of the concepts from the concept class. And we require to the classical algorithm not to output a function such that classify the new input uh, that behaves on new input like the unknown concept, but just to tell me which is the alpha, which is the concept that label this data. And the hardness of this problem is, uh, we don't know. We don't know if it is BQP or uh, if it is easy. So with this, this is my last slide. Uh, what we show in this paper, where we show that there exists an exponential quantum advantages for uh, a learning problem of, uh, of uh, learning observable, and uh, it is a physical rele relevant problem. We show that uh, the associated concept class is a super polynomial size. So we show that uh, basically, the quantum algorithm is not a trivial one. It actually uses a machine learning algorithm uh, and before a quantum, uh, a quantum part where you can extract uh, relevant information, fundamental information. And uh, the observable that we consider can either be linear combination of Pauli or uh, unitarily parameterized observable. We have uh, one open question that is, uh, what is about uh, the identification problem? Can we say something it is hard, is it is classically easy or not? And on that, uh, we, are working it, uh, we are working on it uh, right now, and we hope to publish new results uh, in the following months. So with that, with that, I finish my talk. I thank you for uh, inviting me again here. And uh, yes. Yeah, we thank Ricardo for the very interesting talk. Yeah, to be honest, I couldn't, uh, I need some time to kind of like go and process all the proof scats and stuff, but then 
the motivation of the work is very clear to me, especially how you choose like um to your at the starting point to choose the P two T half and then show all the classical learning CDs and quantum learning CDs and stuff. So that's really kind of a good point to check on for the talk. Um, so for the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself, to ask a question, or type the question in chat, and I could uh have you asked that. But in the meantime, I could ask a couple of questions. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Um, uh, sorry. Fifty four. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over here. Yeah, I think fifty four is fine. Um, this? so over here, you yeah. So you consider the split concept, right? And then you say it's classically easy. Um, ah, sorry, flip and concept. Oh, yeah, yeah, flip concept. This? So you consider, yeah. Um, and then you say if you kind of flip completely, then it's classically easy, right? How about yeah. if you partially flip that? If like, you partially. Yeah, for example, like for example, the like let's consider x and alpha, the dimension is the same for easy consideration, right? Um mm -hmm. and then it's like for this one you basically flip x and alpha, right? But now it's like for example you only split partially, for example, 20% of alpha and uh, x flip and mm -hmm. extrapolate all the way to a hundred percent. There might be a threshold where there will be transitions where you have you can classical cannot be classical to quantum learn, right? Because you know if you completely flip, then um you is classical easy to learn. So I'm just wondering whether it's Possible to do, or is it just a trivial question to ask? Uh, I see one problem that is uh, defining this uh, uh, flipping thing only on alpha that you say, like uh, alpha of the things, to mm -hmm. rigorously defining in a pack framework. Because uh, mm -hmm. again, in pack we are given uh, like a, the labeling of the concept and the input are two very distinct things. So mm -hmm. I don't see it as easy to mix it. I think you can. You no, as in just, just like the mixing. Thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But then, Sorry. Uh, so just, uh, so supposing that you can do it, mm -hmm. uh, the thing here is now, I, I just think that uh, the you have guarantees of uh, classical hardness only on the case where uh, the X, uh, where uh, you don't have a flip concept, basically. So on that, uh, uh, but then uh, I don't understand how can you, uh, so tell, tell me again the idea. No, no, no. It's just like, okay, so you have X and alpha, right? And then just assume the dimension the same. And for flip content, you completely flip alpha and X, right? Like you put out alpha into your quantum state and then X into your polys, and then you are measuring the same state. So it's possibly easy. So if I understand mm -hmm. things correctly. Now you just say, okay, instead of flipping 100%, could we just like flip 20% beforehand before I start everything? Right. Okay, just like, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And beforehand I really sucked that. So now I played 20% of my labels and the alphas. Uh, sorry, alpha okay. and X. Could I still learn that? Or like whether there's a threshold for like transit into from classical unlearnably C to classical. I think uh, so you mean I I take my concept class, which is again a set of function, and I mm -hmm. flip only 80% of them, while the other yeah. I Yes. Well, then uh, using uh, the pack definition, in pack definition, mm -hmm. you learn the concept class if there is a classical algorithm which works for every concept in the concept class. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it just need that one concept is hard, mm -hmm. that uh, you say that a classical algorithm cannot learn the concept class. So yep. it suffices to have uh, one non-flip concept to say this is still a classical hard uh, task to do. I see. And so. Oh, okay. Easy if, if you want to learn it in a pack, uh, like using proper pack definition, which is very. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, we have to learn it, kind of like learning in packs. But, um, so, okay, we have chat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, basically, someone just asked the papers for the work. And, yeah, cat already shared it. So, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, yeah, and I have another question. Over here for the flip concept. Okay, I'm not too sure whether this is making sense or not. Uh, um, because I'm just thinking whether like if you apply some random unitary in your concept, whether we have that we change uh the hardness for quantum to learn. I'm not not too not too sure whether this question makes sense or not. Just thinking of like maybe introduce some 
randomness into your quantum circuit and then trying to just like do some learning. So, I mean, you mean in this could uh, make the thing hard even for a quantum learner or? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just like trying uh, to make things harder for quantum. Yeah. Well, depends. Uh, depends. I mean, uh, how these uh, random gates are, right? I mean, if it's uh, if it's based on uh, I don't know RSA things, this randomness, then a quantum learner can break it. So it's not. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem. So, so again, yeah. like what randomness again? Like, depends uh, how how you define this random uh, gate that you put, right? If they're truly mm -hmm. random, like truly truly mm -hmm. random, then. Uh, I don't know, then I don't know. If mm -hmm. they are uh, random, I don't know, based on, uh, I don't know, factoring things, then uh, of course a quantum learner should be able to do Ah, uh, I see. And uh, yes, basically. No, I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking of like, maybe just like randomly apply hard random single cubic gate, for example, local, like two design gates in like random places in your circuit. And then you still have the concepts and mm. could you still learn that? Yeah, I'm not too, it's yeah, also yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. see, but uh, I should think about it actually. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, so I'm just kind of throwing question to see whether you have kind of opinions on this because, well, you are the good person to ask about this kind of question. Um, okay, and... well, uh, yeah, Casper, maybe you can say something. No, sure. I think you already covered it. No, as long as the random circuit is shallow, you can use the Robert Wang thing. As if you make the random circuit deep, then of course it becomes more difficult yeah, to let's yeah, say learn yeah, it. Yeah. But if the random circuit yeah. is shallow, you can use the methods that sort of come from this concrete example. Yes, I see. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it. That that's very helpful then. I might be able to go to read uh, Robert Rigo to clarify some of the things over there. Um and one more question over here. Could you go back to the previous slides where but okay, basically just like assume uh you well, you're well, not you no, um, so you, you kind of like define some equation for the sampling norm. Oh, sorry. Uh, the sampling norm, like fx minus y. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This. Uh, yes. This one, yes, yeah. So for this one, uh, if, for example, the sampling norm is hard, would it still be learnable in this case? Is that, sorry, is it? If epsilon, the epsilon sampling is high, like, is it still considered learnable or not? Uh, well, 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 uh, I mean, because now over here, mm -hmm, yeah, sorry. This uh, the learning algorithm produce uh, a let's say an output, uh, like a can say that works. Uh, they have produced the correct output in times uh, and uh, using sample which scale polynomially in one over epsilon sample. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, this as long as this epsilon sample is polynomial then uh, mm. your uh, your uh, sample needed and your running time will scale polynomial with this epsilon sample. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we're talking about scaling argument, right? We say that it's yeah. efficient and you require a polynomial uh, sample as a, as a scaling algorithm, right, with n. So mm. if this epsilon sample scale uh, polynomial with the input size, then you're fine. You, your uh, quantum algorithm will need only polynomial number of, uh, of uh, samples. If this epsilon sample scale uh, badly, scale exponential, then uh, you don't have these guarantees anymore. Then uh, you, will you will need exponential many sample and uh, that you really don't need, want it. Right. Now, how about if you consider a fixed uh, epsilon sampling? You just like consider- but Then you have a constant, uh, you have a constant, and then mm -hmm. going up in N, this is a constant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this uh, is not a problem. Like if you okay, have a constant this... error, then uh, mm -hmm. you're, uh, this is just a constant. So it's not a problem. I see. OK, got it. Um, and the other question is along this point, like for quantum learner, you also do some sampling, right? Do you consider this like the bound? So you consider also uh, the differences between the sampling errors for the quantum learner as well. So you have target concepts, right? You have a hypothesis. And now for the uh, target concept, you basically have to do measurement to get y out, and then it's outbound by the sampling error. For the hypothesis, you do the same as well, right? Or do you assume the full access to the hypothesis for the quantum learner? Uh, what? Uh, so you still do measurement? No, sorry, the sorry. The, the hypothesis. The hypothesis uh, 
Okay, I think I understand you, what you're saying. You're saying uh, mm -hmm. assuming errors on uh, the training sample, which uh, are uh, related to the concepts that I want to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. But then I output an hypothesis, and this hypothesis mm -hmm. will uh, will have uh, some uh, errors. This is yes, a, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, but we have uh, bounds on the error, mm -hmm. on the generalization error of this hypothesis. So this hypothesis, if you remember, will come from the lasso in the case, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, in the case of uh, linear uh, Observable will come from last algorithm. In this case, will come will be a quantum circuit where it learns these uh, things. But in any case, this hypothesis will have guarantees on the error that it performs on new axis, and this uh, guarantees is exactly uh, these things, right? Mm -hmm. So the the error that the hypothesis does is related to, I mean, the the output of the hypothesis differs from uh, this f alpha of x from at, at most with this error on average. I don't know right. if this okay. answers your question. I, okay, okay. Basically, everything is encapsulated in this like small epsilon. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Um, yeah, maybe it seems like there's no question from the audience. Maybe they just have to kind of like go back and sit on their talk. If they have question, then they could ask you um like through your emails or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, sure. You can uh, yeah you can send yeah. me emails and stuff. Yeah, so if I have questions, then I will send you email as well. So yeah, yeah, this, sure, um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, might go and bother you. So uh we thanks again uh Ricardo for the very interesting talk. And I kind of like learned a bit uh, quite a lot from uh this talk, especially on the dog process of how you kind of uh the book, how how you prove things. Um, that's very helpful because, like, I, I don't really know how to prove in terms of complexity theory and this, like, let alone coming from complexity theory and then you have to kind of distill down to the learning, learnability. So, uh, I think this paper is very helpful for me to learn that. Yeah, well, thanks again, Ricardo, for the thank you, talk. thank you and, for inviting me. And yeah, and see you guys next time. Bye bye. See you.